All right, we are recording. All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Photography for Nature Lovers. I'm really happy to see all of you on this rainy Friday morning. We're going to have two speakers today. Uh, first up, it's going to be myself. I'm Sean Kittle. I'm the Communications Coordinator for the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program, also known as APIP. And then we're going to have Brian Green. He is the Aquatic Invasive Species Coordinator with APIP as well. Uh, I'm going to cover all the photography stuff. I'm going to cover the photography basics um, and that whole part of it. And then Brian is going to take a little time to just introduce you to some invasive species and show you how to report those invasive species uh, using IMAP Invasive. And I want to give you just a really quick background on myself. I came to the area about 10 years ago as a reporter. Uh, by the area, I mean Saranac Lake. That's where we live. And these days, if you're a reporter in a small to medium-sized newspaper, you're probably also a photographer. Uh, I did not go to school for photography. I went for journalism and ecology. Uh, but because of my reporting job, I also had to be a photographer. And I was very lucky that I knew a couple of professional photographers. And they were very kind, and they took me out, and they showed me a lot of the information that I'm going to be passing along to you. And the reason I tell all of you this is because, you know, you really, you don't have to go to school to be a capable photographer. If you understand some of the camera basics, uh, you know, how the camera works and how to compose a good shot, and then you practice, 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 and I, I can't stress that enough, you have to practice, uh, you can definitely get a good handle on it. So I, I hope you find today's um, workshop valuable and I, and I hope it helps you with your photography. So here's our agenda. Uh, we're going to be covering some camera basics. I'm not going to spend much time on this. Uh, if we were in person, I might talk a little more about the camera, the physical camera itself, uh, but we're not. So it's a little harder to do over, over Zoom. Uh, then we're going to get right into the photography basics, which I'm assuming is why you're all here. And that's where we're going to cover uh, how to use a camera, what all those different settings mean, and how to use them to get the kind of photo that you're looking for. Uh, from there, we're going to cover photo composition and best practices, so how you actually uh, line up a shot and and how to think about using the space you know, in that viewfinder to get a good photo that tells a story. Uh, then I'm gonna talk about how to photograph plants for identification purposes. Uh, then I'm gonna hand it over to Brian, who's gonna talk about six common invasive species. And then he's going to do a brief uh, talk about IMAP invasives, which is where you can import the report uh, if you think you see an invasive species. And that's really important. And this all kind of comes together in a nice way because someone at the other end of IMAP invasives is looking at those photos and trying to figure out if you have in fact seen an invasive species. And that's really hard to do if the photo isn't clear, if they can't see the parts of the plant that they need to see to identify that species. So that's uh, why we're gonna be talking about that. And then we'll have plenty of time for a and a I love talking about photography, so please ask away and I'll, I'll do my best to answer every question that I can. Camera basics are, the camera basically has two parts that we're gonna talk about, a body and a lens. Even if you're using a cell phone, there's a lens in that cell phone. The lens is what is communicating the information from the outside world to the camera body. So when you're looking through the camera and you wanna take a photo, the lens is the, one, is the part that's collecting that information. A uh, question that I've been asked before is, what kind of camera setup should I get? What kind of camera should I buy? And if you're on a budget, like most people are, you, you know, you, you're limited by what you can get, right? So if you have a certain amount of money to spend, I really recommend people aim more for a medium a range kind of camera body and then spend a little more money on the lens because the lens is what's going to give you the clarity. It's going to give you the, the nice colors, the crispness. A lot of that stuff is going to come from the lens. And if you go out and spend thousands and thousands of dollars on a camera body and skimp on the lens, you're not going to get the most value out of that camera body because it's not getting the information it needs to get the photo that you want. So really go for that middle range uh, camera body and then don't skimp on the lens. And then when you start to notice the limitations of your equipment, which means you're becoming a better photographer, uh, when you start to notice those limitations, you might want to upgrade the body and now you have a lens that you can just pop on there. It's really nice. And uh, yeah, I should also mention that most cell phone cameras these days are really good. Uh, so if you have a cell phone, um, go in there and see, uh, as we start talking about manual settings, um, most modern cell phones allow you to take control and, and actually enter manual settings. And, and that's a lot of fun to experiment with. 
Uh, cleaning the lens is just like cleaning your glasses. I just wanted to touch upon it. Uh, use, I think it's called a microfiber cloth, right? Those really soft cloths they give you for eyeglasses. Always wipe in a circular motion. And if you get dirt or grit on there, uh, blow it off. You know, if it's a thumbprint or a little water drop, you can wipe it off. But if it's dirt, if you're moving that grit across the glass, even if it's a microfiber uh, cloth that you're using, you're going to be scratching that glass. So it's really important to take good care of the glass. Um, keep batteries charged. I learned this the hard way. I was shooting a luge competition over at Mount Van Hovenberg, I believe it was, or no, it was bobsled, sorry. And it was freezing out. And my camera battery died in about 15 minutes. I reached in my backpack, got my spare, put that in there and it was dead too because it was so cold out. So if you're going out for the day, bring three or four batteries with you, make sure they're fully charged. And if it's cold, use that zipper on the inside of your jacket, pop the batteries in there, that your body heat will actually help keep them warm and help keep them from draining. Uh, again, I learned that the hard way and I was, I was running into the little warming hut trying to charge the camera and get back out there. Oh, it was the best. And then memory card, I just wanted to mention, it's really good practice. You know, if you're using a digital camera, you'll have an SD card with it. Every once in a while, you're going to want to put that SD card in your computer, get all your photos off of it that you want to keep, and then put the SD card back in the camera and format it. And formatting it is going to delete anything that's on it, but it's also going to get ri rid of any potentially like corrupted files that might be on there. And a corrupted file could ruin your memory card and you lose all your photos. So just, you know, depending on how often you're, you're out there shooting, you might every, every few months, every six months, you might just want to do that and reformat your memory card. It's just good practice. All right, so let's get into photography. Uh, manual versus auto. If you're shooting with a camera more than like, or with a phone rather, more than likely you've been using the auto setting. And, and that's great. You know, the auto setting is quick and it's easy. And as I mentioned before, like most modern cameras make photographers mad because they're so good at getting good photos and there's very little skill involved. Uh, but there are some pros to using the auto setting. Uh, mostly you have no control over the image. So a couple of examples I listed here, if you want to blur the background, we're going to get into that later, uh, you're going to need to use your manual or aperture priority mode on your digital camera. Uh, some desired effects like this uh, waterfall here, you can see how the, the action is not frozen, right? You can see the movement of the water. You get that by doing a longer shutter speed, by keeping the shutter speed open, even just for a second, uh, that water's moving so fast, you'll get a nice blur on it. Or if you've ever seen those really pretty night sky photos, photos with the stars streaking across the sky. That's a long uh, shutter speed time. And you can't really do that uh, as well with uh, auto setting. You can't do it at all with auto settings and it's gonna be more difficult to do with a camera that's on your cell phone. Um, yeah, and another thing too that is on here, but if you've ever been out, like if you're you're in a gazebo with your friends and it's a bright sunny day outside, but you're in the gazebo and you wanna take a picture of your friend, you notice the background is all blown out. It's really bright. That's because your camera needs to know how to read the light. So if you're pointing it at your friend, it's reading light for that dark condition, which means it's letting in way too much light from the outside making the background bright. With manual settings, you can often find a middle ground and kind of work with that. It won't be perfect, but you can often get a better shot using the settings. So what are these settings I'm talking about? Uh, the more expensive your camera, the more settings you're going to have. But the three that you really need to be aware of, these are the basics. I call them the big three. They are ISO, shutter speed, and f-stop slash aperture. F-stop and aperture are used interchangeably, um, but F-stop is the setting that controls the camera's aperture. We'll get into that a little more later. Uh, but just, you know, you might hear me say F-stop or aperture. It's because most people use them interchangeably. All three of these do different things, but the real takeaway I want you all to get from this is that all three of these settings affect how light enters the camera. And that's really important. And then they often do other things too, which we'll get into. So is ISO shutter speed and F-stop new to everyone here? Have you guys heard of that? Yeah, good, good. <laughs> Let's talk about what they mean. It's not as hard as you think. Um, understanding ISO. So ISO, when I'm out and I'm shooting manually, I'm thinking about the big three. I'm thinking about those three settings. The first one I usually deal with is ISO. So ISO determines how sensitive the camera is to light. Kind of an easier way to say that is, um, if you're in a dark situation, you wanna use a higher ISO. If you're in a really bright, sunny day kind of situation, you're going to want to use a lower ISO. 
this chart is really handy and it's kind of funny because the, the top three things on the on the uh, little little chart here basically say the same thing it's in, in different ways um yeah it'll capture less light it's less sensitive to light more light needed for a good exposure so a low iso means the camera is less sensitive to light a high iso means it's more sensitive um so you're going to want to use that low iso in well lit conditions and one thing to note is that high isos can create grainy images. If you've ever seen a, an image, or noisy is another word for it, that looks really grainy and noisy, it's probably because the person cranked the ISO uh, when they took the picture. And there's ways to avoid that we'll, that we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, another thing I want to note, too, is if you're looking at your digital camera, and I, I'm not as familiar with, with phone cameras, but I, I'm guessing this might be the, this might apply. Most digital cameras allow you to choose a higher ISO than the camera body is capable of handling. So I have a Canon Rebel. I like it. It's a good mid-range camera. It's light. But if I put the ISO to 3200 or 6400, I'm getting a grainy image. I don't know why the camera lets me do it that high. Maybe it's an advertising thing where it's like, hey, you can go up to 6400. But it really can't because the image quality is, is pretty bad. So in general, unless you have a pretty expensive camera and a really nice lens, you're going to want to keep that ISO at 1600 or lower. 3200 maybe, but that's kind of where you're going to start to see some grain, uh, at least with the cameras I've used. And anything below that, you're safe. So if it's bright and sunny, I'll start with an ISO around 50 or 100. If it's a rainy day like today, or I'm in the woods where there's a nice canopy, I'm probably going to want to shoot for around 800. And then if I'm indoors, I'm probably going to want to start at 1600. And, you know, I've covered a lot of board meetings from being a reporter, and these meetings all take place in really dark rooms. I don't know why. So oftentimes, I'd find myself cranking it to 3200 and dealing with a little grain just because it was the only way to get an image. Sometimes you just have to. So here's an example. This was taken in Bandelier uh, National Monument um, a couple months ago. If you look on the left, I had the ISO way too low for the conditions. See how dark that is? And then I simply turned the ISO up a couple notches, and immediately you can see that the difference, how much brighter that image is. And this was taken, this is my daughter, Lucina. This was taken in a place called Meow Wolf, which is in Santa Fe. Really cool place. If you've never been there, I definitely suggest it if you're in Santa Fe. Uh, but you see how this, there's grain in this image. Do you see the noise? If you look at her cheeks, you can kind of see there's it's like dots on there. That's from having a really high ISO when I took the photo. But this room was pitch black, except for these little lasers that were coming down. So the only way to take a picture at all was to have a high ISO with my equipment anyway. <laughs> All right, shutter speed, I think, is the easiest one to remember because the word speed is right in the name. The shutter speed is literally how fast your camera shutter opens and closes when you take that picture. And it's amazing how much movement there is in like half a second. You wouldn't think it, but there is. So the way the numbers are written with shutter speed is you'll have like a shutter speed of two or a shutter speed of 4,000. The easy way to do it is put a one over that number and make it a fraction. So a shutter speed of two is going to open the shutter for a half a second. A shutter speed of 4,000 is going to open the shutter for one four thousandth of a second. Super, super fast. If you're shooting um, something that's moving fast, uh, a, a car going by, an animal running, and you want to capture that motion, you want to freeze it, then you're going to want to use a super fast shutter speed like 4,000. Um, you know, if you're in just a regular situation with, you know, kids playing or you want to take a nice picture of a view, you can get away with having a much slower shutter speed because nothing is moving in the photo uh, or in the image that you want to capture. So a low shutter speed, think about this. When that shutter is opening, what's happening? Light is getting into the lens, right? So a low shutter speed like two is a half second. That's going to let more light into the camera because the shutter is open longer than if you're using a shutter speed of one four thousandth of a second. That's super fast. Um, the other thing about a low shutter speed is it will produce a blur effect on fast moving objects, but it can also give you camera shake. Your body moves more than you realize, and you're taking that photo and the shutter is open for a half a second. Any little motion of your, your hand shaking or uh, you lean just slightly during that half second is going to come out in the photo. It's going to come out as a blur. So when you're looking at ISO, 
if you're in a dark situation and you don't want to crank your ISO because you don't want to get a grainy image, maybe you put the ISO at 1600, which is pretty high, you might have to lower your shutter speed to compensate because, or to let more light in, right? So there's ways to let more light into the camera besides relying on one uh, setting, which is really what I'm trying to get across here. Um, you put that ISO at 1600, it's still a little dark, try lowering the shutter speed a little bit. If you're covering a meeting where people aren't really moving around too much, you might be able to get away with having, you know, a half second or a quarter second shutter speed, which is going to let in way more light. And here's a couple examples. Um, this is in Meow Wolf as well, but this is camera shake. You can see those images almost look like your eyes are almost blurry looking at it. It's because the shutter was open for just a little bit too long when I took the photo and uh, it, it created this little bit of motion. And that, that's the motion for me, not even like these imperceptible movements that we all do. And then there's that waterfall picture again. So the person who took this probably used a tripod um, because, you know, a tripod is not going to move. It's not going to pick up that, that those little uh, motions that I was talking about. Uh, you set your camera up on a tripod, have that shutter open for a second, and you're going to capture this nice effect of the water moving. Uh, one thing you can do if you don't have a tripod is you can do a human tripod, I've heard it called. You basically tuck your elbows into your sides, which really helps stabilize you. And then you, you put that camera or your phone, you know, up and take the photo that way. It's surprising how much that can help. And the last of the big three is f-stop or aperture. So you can see here, there's the aperture opening on that little scale up at the top there. The f-stop controls how wide the camera's aperture opens. So a lower f-stop means the aperture is going to open wider. So kind of like shutter speed, if you have a lower f-stop, that aperture is opening more, what's happening? more light is getting into that lens, right? Because it's opening more. And it's, it's, it's just a nice visual to think about. The f-stop also has the really cool, actually, before I say that, so if you're in a, a low light situation and you're trying to deal with not getting grain, not getting too much motion blur, right? One other thing you can do is use a low f-stop. Now, the f-stop is going to be determined by your lens, so you'll have to look at your, your cell phone camera and see how low that can shoot. They call it shoot, how low can your camera shoot, if you've ever heard anyone say that they're talking about f-stop. Um, you know, so, so just go in the settings and kind of take a look and see uh, how low that f-stop can go. And, and then your camera lens, if you have a digital camera, is going to determine your f-stop. So there are low-light camera lenses that will shoot down to like 1.4, which is really low. Uh, a lot of kind of generic le lenses are going to be more in the 4 to 5.6 range for as low as they can go. Um, I have one that has uh, a nice zoom feature that shoots down to 2.8. A, or maybe it might be a little lower than that, I forget. Uh, so it's really nice because it allows me to zoom in and still shoot uh, in pretty low light. And, and the f-stop makes a big difference when you start adjusting it. Um, so the other thing that f-stop does is it affects the image's depth of field. So the lower f-stop, have you ever seen a picture, I'll show you a couple here in a second, where the subject is perfectly in focus, but the background is out of focus? That's a low f-stop. That's how you get that effect. Uh, if you're taking a photo of a mountain range, you're probably going to want to use a higher f-stop because you, you want everything to be in focus. Um, but if you really want to focus on one object, one part of that photo, you want it to stand out, you're going to want to use a lower f-stop. And here are some examples. So this is my wife, Anna, and she was kind enough to pose for these photos for this workshop. This is up on Mount Joe. So if you look at the top photo, I used a low f-stop. I think it was about 2.8. And you can see how the uh, plants in the background are kind of out of focus. They're really soft. And then if you look down, I used around f-18 for that one, and they're all sharp. Everything in the image is in focus. You can also see, uh, I don't know how well you can see it on your screens, but that lower photo is also slightly darker. So when I put that f-stop up to take this photo, I, I didn't adjust something else enough. I could have adjusted my ISO, I could have adjusted my shutter speed to let in a little bit more light, but you can see how the image did get a little bit darker. And here's another example also taken on Mount Joe. That's just my hand, but I wanted to really show you what that f-stop does. So that top photo, look how out of focus that background is, and then the bottom photo, look how in focus everything, including my hand is. That's the effect of the f-stop. And I did a, a better job of, of adjusting those other settings for that lower photo because it's pretty, pretty consistent with the top one uh, in terms of lighting. 
And then here, if we're going to talk about taking a picture of a plant or a species, this is winged burning bush. It is an invasive species. Um, I took this photo out in uh, I'll say, well, I believe it was. And you can see I was looking down at the forest floor, taking a picture of this branch. And you can see how the forest floor is out of focus. Uh, if that forest floor were in focus, I wasn't thinking of the photo workshop at the time. I should have taken another photo with it in focus. But a lot of those details on that plant, the leaves and maybe the corky little wings on the stem, would get lost in the sticks and the, the moss and the shrubs and things that are that are in the background there. You know, green against green is, is going to get lost. So by lowering the f-stop, I was able to focus right on the thing that I wanted to take a picture of, which was the bush, uh, and, and make it pop against that kind of busy, confusing background there. And putting it all together, I kind of mentioned this before, but all three of these things work together. So if you lower or raise one of these settings, chances are you're going to have to lower or raise one of the other settings to compensate for it. Uh, shutter speed, just in quick review, is not only going to let more light into the camera if you have the shutter open for longer, it's also going to capture whatever is happening in that moment. So if it's open for a second, whatever happens during that second is going to get captured in the photo. So you're going to get blur, you're going to get motion blur, and you have to be careful of your own shakiness when you're using a lower shutter speed. Um, ISO, <clears throat> is that one is more just light sensitivity, right? The other one, the other two do something else on the side besides affecting light. ISO is pretty much just light. Um, and I guess I, you could say quality of the image too, because a high ISO is going to give you noise and grain, but it's also going to be better in dim low light settings. Lower ISO, that's where you want to be if you're shooting outside and it's nice and sunny out, if it's a really bright condition. And then usually if it's cloudy or overcast, I start around 400 or 800 with my ISO. And depending on the day, I might have to raise it or lower it or depending on my other settings, but that's usually where I start. And then aperture is uh, how wide the aperture actually opens. So you're going to get uh, your aperture opening more with a lower uh, yeah, f-stop, sorry. <laughs> I'm confusing myself now with the interchangeable words. Uh, so an f-stop of 1.4 is going to let that aperture open more. It's going to let more light in. It's going to blur your background. Um, higher aperture, like, well, this goes up to f32 on this little chart here. Uh, you're going to get everything in focus, um, but you're also, it's not going to let as much light in. So you're going to need to do something, maybe raise your ISO or lower your shutter speed to let more light into the camera. So here, it's time for a quick quiz. We're going to talk a little more about some of these things here in a minute, too, but let's just put it all together. How can we make this photo better? Does anybody have any idea of how we can make Lucina brighter in this image? If you want to just unmute and throw it out there, that'd be great. Increase your ISO. Yes, that's one way we could do it. Anybody else have a suggestion? Because that's not the only way. Um, I think decrease the one you were just talking about, aperture. Yes. Yeah, lowering the aperture, the f-stop will do that. Now, if we want that background in focus, we're going to lose that, right? But we will get a brighter photo. That's it. And there's one more setting we can adjust. I think I just heard someone say shutter speed. Did someone just say shutter speed? I think someone did. Lucina's not really moving in this photo. Um, which means we might be safe uh, lowering that shutter speed a little bit to let more light in the camera, uh, especially if we don't want to lower our f-stop too much, right? If we want to keep that background in focus. Yeah, good job, everyone. See, that's much better. <clears throat> all right, now let's talk about photo composition. So you have a decent handle on what all these crazy settings do. You're ready to go out and take a photo. There's a little more to it than just pointing and shooting. Uh, if you want to tell a story, and, and, and you know, I, I always go back to storytelling. I like to write. Uh, I like to take photos. And really, it all boils down to telling a story. If you have a website, you're telling your organization's story. If you have a Facebook page, you're telling a story. Uh, that's what we're doing. A photo does the same thing. And photo composition plays a big role in that. So you can get these nice, clear, crisp photos. But without good photo composition, your images are not going to be as effective. So the first thing, we're going to talk about two things here. We're going to talk about rule of thirds and then the Fibonacci uh, spiral. So the rule of thirds, when you look through your, your 
camera on your phone or through your digital camera, just kind of imagine that um, that field of vision is divided into thirds, both vertically and horizontally. Do you see where those circles are, where those lines intersect? That is approximately, I say approximately, where you want the subject of your photo to be. And there, there's a lot that has gone into this in terms of you know people studying where people's eye go when they view a photo. And it's sort of baked into this idea that the person's eye doesn't go to the middle of an image. It goes to one of these three spots. And I'll show you some examples of that. So I, I did not take this photo. This photo is is great uh, composition wise. Okay, so you have um, the person is standing there looking out at the ocean, right? First of all, uh, I think it's a she. The she she is not looking off the edge of the photo, right? She's looking this way. So your eye wants to go and see what she's looking at. Uh, the person's head is right at that top right intersection. She is the subject of the photo. And the really nice thing about this is her body goes along that vertical line on the left. So your eye is going to naturally travel around this image. It's going to go right to, to the person's head, right? Like, well, a person, you go right to the person's head, you kind of follow the body down across the rocks and then out to the landscape that she's looking at or the seascape as the case may be. Uh, the other nice thing about this image is the rule of thirds isn't just there for those pinpoints, but it's also a way you, to divide an image into thirds. So if you look at the bottom third, you'll see you've got ocean and rocks. The top, or the sorry, the middle third, you've got kind of some blank sky, and you've got the person, and then the top third is that that nice cloud. So this photo is really divided into thirds in a couple of different ways. And it does a really good job of using that that intersection in the top right to get the viewer's attention. So here's another one. This is the one that was on the on the cover, but you'll see that boat there. It's not right at the intersection, and that's okay. It's really close to it. And here, your eye kind of follows the angle of the boat across the water into the mountains, which is which is really nice. And here's just a good example. There aren't lines on this one. I think you can you can picture how this is divided into thirds, right? You have beach, you have water, and you have sky. Uh, I, I would say that this image really needs a subject. There isn't really a subject in it, but I just wanted to show it to you because it's really nice how it divides the image. And then this one is cool because it kind of breaks the rules a little bit while also adhering to the rules. So I thought it was an interesting one to show. Uh, I would argue that the subject or the main thing your eye goes to is that road, which is right smack dab in the middle of the photo. It's okay to sort of break the rules a little bit, um, depending on the effect you're going for. So now that I've told you, pay attention to the rule of thirds, I'm also telling you to go ahead and ignore them, right? <laughs> but you'll see, look where the horizon is. It's on that top line. It does follow the rule of thirds in that regard. And you can also see that the road has basically an equal amount of deserts on the right and left of it. So there is sort of a thirds kind of thing going on there. But this photo is really effective because it literally draws your eye right down that road to the beautiful landscape that's on the horizon there. And this is the Fibonacci spiral. Uh, this is a little more complicated, but I think it's really interesting just to touch on, just to get you thinking. And what this really deals with is how the viewer's eye travels around an image. I, I think it's fascinating. So you'll see, um, I wish you could see where my finger is pointing with the busiest part of it there, kind of sort of in the top left where the spiral begins. That's where a viewer's eye tends to go in an image. Now, this can be flipped around. It's not necessarily at, at this you know, angle every time. Um, and th then it tends to follow that spiral line. The eye tends to follow that spiral line throughout the photo. So take a look at this. The eye tends to go right to that person who's walking underneath the tree. And then it'll probably kind of go up. Now you see the trees. And then you sort of go over and look at the rest of the photo. It's, just, it's kind of this like unconscious or subconscious thing that we do. Um, but you know, this has been studied, uh, and you'll see like famous works of art, paintings and things also follow this. And here's another image. The main focus of that image is definitely that mountain right there. Your eye kind of goes right to it, but then it sort of follows that spiral around and takes in the rest of the landscape as you're looking at it. Oh, here we go. Sorry, I had someone come in. 
And I mentioned that a lot of paintings, you've probably seen this image before or one similar to this. It's a, a pretty popular painting style from back in the day. This also, like, it follows the Fibonacci spiral to a T. I thought that was really cool. You know, you're going to kind of go up to that top of that wave there and then look at how you follow those nice curves around the image. So here's a few general photography tips that kind of bring all these ideas together. Um, one, think about how the subject fits in the frame. I'm going to show you some examples of this uh, when we're done. Uh, two, don't be afraid to get close to your subject. Uh, three, create a sense of place. Show the person in their environment. And when you photograph people, show their faces. People love to see people. It's compelling to us. We're human beings. We like to see people's faces. And when you get back to the idea of telling a story with photography, people's faces definitely tell a story. You know, how they're reacting to something happy, sad, confused, that all comes across as someone's face, on someone's face, and it really helps tell the story of what's going on in the image. Um, I should also mention that all four of these tips don't necessarily apply. Like, you don't necessarily do all four in one photo. Um, you know, you might be getting close to your subject, which is tip number two, that might make it harder to show the sense of place because you're focusing on the person, right? That that's okay. But these are just things to think about as you're as you're taking some photos. So here's some photos. I, I most of these I took, I believe. I'll let you know if I didn't, but um this is a stem injection <clears throat> on Phragmites. Uh, your eye is going to go right to where that that needle is going into the stem. Uh, if you can imagine the rule of thirds drawn on this image, that stalk, that stem that he's holding is going to be pretty close to that rule of thirds line, if not right on it. And your eye is going to kind of travel around the image. You go right to that point where the needle is going in, but then your eye kind of moves around the image and takes in the rest of it. And this is an example of getting close to the subject as well. If I took this photo from you know, five feet away, you could probably see what the person was doing, but not exactly, right? Like this really hones in on here, this is what I'm trying to show you. And this is a picture I took when they were building the ice palace here in Saranac Lake. If you're not from the region, we build an ice palace every year and we cut blocks of ice out of the lake and make a palace <laughs> out of them that people can walk through. It's really cool. And here you can't even really see the people's faces, but that wasn't what I was trying to show. I wanted to show the work and the different tools that were being used. Uh, so you can see the saw blade going in, but somebody's using a chainsaw in the background. There's a line of people. There's a lot going on. You get the impression that it's busy and that there's people working on this. Uh, I did not take this photo, but I really like it. Um, this is, I believe this is a biocontrol release uh, for Hemlock Woolly Adelgid, if I'm not mistaken. And again, that point where his hand is on the branch is really close to one of those rule of thirds intersections. Your eye is going to kind of go right to that to see what he's doing. And then you're going to kind of follow his arm you know, to the little, uh, not a vial, but the little jar that he's holding and then kind of up to his face. And then there's a sense of place here too, right? He's in the forest. There's a little bit of light shining through the trees. And if you look at his face, he's, he's happy, but he's concentrating. He's paying attention. So it you know, tells a little bit of a story. And here, I took this photo. Um, this is out by Whiteface. That's Whiteface in the background. Now, I, I kind of wish the person in the photo was a little higher and over to the left. Like, she, it's not perfectly composed, but I wanted to show it for that reason. Uh, it does give you the sense of place. This person's working in this kind of wetland type area. You've got cattails poking up, and then there's this big mountain in the background. So it's pretty cool. Uh, I was severely limited by the landscape here. I was standing on the guardrail, if I remember right, on Route 86 between Lake Blanston and Wilmington. Uh, if I could have stepped back a little further or pulled out a ladder and, and you know got myself a little bit higher, I would have. Uh, but I wasn't, and I wanted to capture this uh, person walking through. And also notice she's wearing bright orange, which really makes her pop against that that kind of green background there. Uh, here's a photo of a field trip we did with APIP. Now, you can't see everyone's face in this photo, but that's okay because they're standing in a circle and there's really no way to do that. Um, most cameras, uh, digital cameras, have a a lens that you can pop out and move around. And if you have a cell phone, it's even easier because you can look at the screen. To take this photo, I raised the camera up above my head and I used that little lens. I turned it down so I could look up at it and, and angle the camera and get the photo uh, that I wanted to. So think about that too. Like you don't necessarily have to take a photo from 
your your eye height, right? You can raise your camera up above your head. You can put it down near the ground and get images that way. That's actually what I did with that for um, Fragmites injection photo a couple photos back was I put the camera right down near the ground. I wasn't laying on my stomach because I was standing in four inches of water, uh, but I was able to get down low anyway. And And this, you know, putting the camera up a little bit higher made it so that you know, the guy in the hat in the foreground here on the left, he wasn't blocking the person that's kind of standing behind him. You can still see her face. And, and that was because I raised the camera up a little bit higher. And there's also a sense of place here, right? They're on a trail. You can see the trail go back. So here's a tip that I love to share with people. If you've ever taken a photo when you're out, you know, with a magnificent view of the mountains, and you look at it later, and you're like, those mountains looked way bigger in person. Here is what you can do to make that not happen. This is the picture I took of Anna. This is on top of Mount Joe. So the first picture, I I, I was open wide. You know, I had the, the wide angle on the lens. And you can see it kind of looks flat. Those mountains, like you can tell they're mountains, but they don't look super impressive. And then I zoomed in on her and took the photo from pretty much the same place. And you can see how zooming in actually brings the background forward. And the effect that that's going to create is it's going to make things like mountains or buildings or something that's in the background look a lot more like how they look in real life. So when I'm standing on Mount Joe, if you've never been there, it's amazing. It's a little mountain in the high peaks. You look around and you're surrounded by a bunch of our higher mountains. So they're, they're kind of towering above you. It's really dramatic. That top photo does not do it justice, but the bottom photo is what it looks like. You're standing there and you're looking up at these bigger mountains like, wow, look at that thing. And so you get that effect by zooming in. And you can do that with a phone camera. Uh, I think someone's trying it right now, but you can do that with like the pinch move on the camera. Uh, as I mentioned before, your phone camera has a lens. It doesn't detach like a digital camera lens does, but there is a lens in there. And many of these newer cameras on cell phones can zoom in. So try that out. And it works. And, it, you know, it doesn't take the more you zoom, the more you're going to bring that background forward. Right. So but it doesn't take zooming in much to, to create this effect where the mountains are coming forward and looking bigger. And this is us. We were in uh, Estes Park, Colorado. We did a hike up in the Rocky Mountains. And you'll notice here I tilted the camera a little bit to get this image. And that's the reason I'm showing it is because you don't always have to shoot straight, like, like level. You can, it's, I believe it's called a Dutch angle. This, this is a pretty mo minor Dutch angle, but when you tilt the camera, so your subject is kind of in the lower corner and then you have your background, like this mountain range here, um, sometimes that's the best way to fit everything into the image. And it, it also creates this nice effect where, you know, your eye kind of goes right to Anna or maybe it goes to the mountain, but then it follows that. Either way, it's going to follow that mountain range to the other part of the photo. And the Dutch angle definitely does kind of kind of create that effect. Um, so think about playing around a little bit with angles uh, to get everything that you want in the image. And the last thing I want to cover is shooting an event. And I use the term event, you know, loosely, but shooting a thing that's happening. Uh, the example I'm going to use is the Moody Pond Milfoil poll. This is a photo shoot I did last year with APIP. If you're in an organization and you're running a web page or a website, I should say, uh, you have social media, uh, maybe you're doing flyers, maybe you're doing an annual report, you want to have images for these different things. Uh, so variety is so important. I've done a lot of these kinds of things and I can tell you like just having a lot of images to choose from is so, so helpful. So when you go out to shoot an event or anything that's happening where, you know, people working out in the field or doing research or whatever it is, think about variety. Think about the different types of photos you can get because you never know when you're going to say, hey, I just need like a kind of a nice scenic shot for a background for our annual report. You, you know, you might not have that image, you know, you're going to want to think ahead a little bit and try to get them as you're out and about throughout the year. So you, oh, wait, we did that Moody Pond Milfoil poll and I got a really nice picture of the pond. We could use that. Um, so just kind of think outside the box and think beyond just, I'm going to just take pictures of people doing things um, and you'll thank yourself for it later. And so this was one event. I was here for maybe less than two hours, I would say. And uh, I, you know, I also spent some time interviewing people for uh, some work that APIP is doing, and I took some photos. Um, 
this first photo is one of the divers about to go under. So here's, this is not a posed shot. This is a candid shot. Um, he was just doing his thing and I took a picture of him. And you, you can kind of tell it's in the morning. You can see the mist rising off the pond in the background. You can see the light filtering through the trees. Uh, he's concentrating, he's putting his flipper on there. And your eye is going to sort of go right to him and follow that dock. That dock creates a nice line for the eye to follow. And then you see like, oh, he has all this equipment here. It, it kind of tells a story, you know. Uh, he, he looks a little tired. I think it's probably just his, his posture. But, you know, it's early in the morning. He's getting up. He's getting ready to go dive under. So there's a little bit of a story here. There's a sense of place. And then there's that kind of curiosity of like, what's that thing with the flag on? It? What's going on here? There, there's a, you know, there, there's a lot going on in this image. And here we have one of the scouts. They kind of go out in the boats and they look for where the uh, milfoil patches they're looking for milfoil uh, are. And then he can kind of direct the diver like, hey, I found one. Um, this image, it's a little more posed because he looked up at me. But again, you know, his body and the kayak is right around where the rule of thirds will intersect. You can see that there's something floating. That thing with the flag on it, it's out there floating now, right? That's the, the air tank for the diver to use. It, we've actually used this photo. I believe we did some kind of a uh, lake protectors uh advertisement or webinar or something uh but a graphic uh but we needed a picture of someone in a boat and i had this image and if you crop it so it's just him you know it's just a guy in a kayak right so you, you, it, it has kind of a dual purpose if we're going to use it for the milfoil pole fine but we now we have a picture of somebody in a kayak that we can use as well um here's guy middleton and he's holding up some milfoil and this just shows how long that plant is you know I, i'd say guy is probably about six feet tall this plant's about six feet tall so i thought that was kind of cool to show and you can see in the background too the sky is white now i don't remember if the sky was overcast or if it's just a little blown out because my settings were to adjust the light for guy he was wearing a dark shirt standing in front of a, a darker colored pond that may have blown out um, that sky you see above the trees so here's one of the divers coming up. So he popped up and I said, show me that milfoil. And he held it up and I snapped the shot real quick. Um, but it kind of shows the work they're doing. It shows what it looks like when they come out of the water. Here's some milfoil on the canoe. So you can see that, or the kayak. So you can see now I'm getting different types of shots. They're not just shots with people in them. And you know this could make a good header photo. Um, this could be posted on Facebook to show milfoil. There's a number of ways you could use this. Um, it might be great for a banner on a web page. And here we're going we're gonna to start talking about photographing species in a minute. And this is a good example of that. I had Guy hold up the milfoil. You can see a milfoil will actually, roots will grow on the top of the plant. And then that stem can break itself off. Uh, the top of the plant will float away. And those roots are just primed and ready to settle down into, into some uh, dirt somewhere and take root again. So it's one of the ways the plant spreads. And I blurred the background on this shot. So you could tell there's water, obviously. But the hand and the plant especially really pops against that. Well, otherwise might be kind of a distracting and busy background. Um, you barely even notice it because you're looking right at that plant. And that's what I wanted. And here's just an example of a scenic shot. Um, you know, I thought this was really pretty. Uh, the flower is right about where the rule of thirds is. Again, you kind of follow those lily pads around. Uh, the flower is the subject. I think we actually did use this in our last annual report, but this, this is a great kind of image just to collect if you're part of an organization. Uh, you know, it makes a great Facebook banner, good for a web page, good for just like a background if you're doing, again, like an annual report or something like that. Uh, just something, you know, it's kind of nice and pretty to look at. All right, and then last but not least, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to photograph plants for identification purposes. So when you think you see an invasive species, you can report it on IMAP invasives. Brian's going to talk about that. You take an image of the, the, the species of the plant or insect that you think is invasive, and you upload it to IMAP. Somebody on the other end of IMAP has to look at that photo and say, yes, this is an invasive species, or nope, that's something else. But good, good to know it's not there, right? In order for them to do that, they need to be able to see the species. They can't touch it themselves. They can't flip it over and do the things that they might want to do. So when you're taking a photo, you, there's certain things you're going to want to think about that a scientist would really appreciate being able to see uh, so they can better identify the plant. 
So, and this picture on the right is a Japanese knotweed. And you can see that there's little clusters of flowers. You can see the stem is zigzagged, right? You can see what the edge of the leaf looks like. You can see how the veins are. This is going to be really helpful to someone who's trying to identify and determine whether or not that's Japanese knotweed. Uh, it is. Uh, so leaves, are they growing? And I'll, I'll dive into each one of these a little bit um, deeper here in a second. But the leaves, are they growing opposite along the stem or do they alternate? The stem, take a look at it. And this is really great if you want to get into plant ID too. Is the stem round or is it is it square shaped? Some plant stems are square shaped. Is it woody? Is it hairy? Is it smooth? Are there thorns on it? These are things that someone identifying a plant will want to see. And then flowers, how many petals are there? Uh, do, do the flowers grow in clusters or is it just like a single flower on the end of a stem like a dandelion? So just a couple examples, opposite leaves. Uh, this is a sugar maple in my yard. And you can see on the left there how the leaves are coming out of the stem. They are all right across from each other. That's what I mean when I say opposite leaves. And then if you look at the image on the right, those leaves are alternating along the stem. They're staggered. That's what that means. So it's good if you're taking a photo of a plant for ID purposes, even if it's a flower, show where the leaves are. Uh, flowers are a whole other thing. You know, some of the leaves come up from the, the base of the plant like that. Some of them grow along the stem. Some of them have little branches coming off. So you're going to want to capture that for whoever's trying to ID it. And then on the left is a purple loosestrife that has a square stem. And you can see in this image, this was actually taken from IMAP Invasives. That's why there's that little uh, number there in the lower right hand corner. Uh, but yeah, I found, I found this image on IMAP. Uh, but you can see clearly that stem is square shaped and the leaves are growing across from each other, right? You can tell that too. And then there's our dandelions on the right. They have a nice round stem. And then flowers, really, you know, there's a whole world with flowers that you can get into. Really what I just want to get across here is how differently they can grow. So, you know, on the left there, you have them, those flowers are coming right out of that stalk and they're going right up the stalk. Uh, top right, you have a flower that's growing at the top of a stem, kind of like the dandelion. And then on the lower right, that um, dogwood there, you have these little clusters of flowers. From afar, they almost look like one flower. But when you get up close, you see that it's just a little, you know, bunches or clusters of little tiny flowers. And again, these are things that you're going to want to show if you um, are taking a photo for ID purposes. So please, if you have questions, jot them down or put them in the chat, and then we'll, we'll get to them at the end. I'll, I'll go through the chat systematically. Uh, I haven't read any of it yet, but I do see that there are questions in the chat. Um, so yeah, I'll definitely take time to go through all of those for you. Oh, and lastly, sorry, I, I thought I was done. I forgot I had a couple more slides here. Aquatic plants are easier to ID in water. Um, because when you take an aquatic plant out of the water, what happens? It all kind of goes limp, right? If it's in the water, like you can see on the left and the right here, like suddenly those little green parts are free to float around and they're just way easier to see. It's, it's like a feather. And here's a couple ways too, if you're out in the field to really make a plant pop. Uh, a white background, if you, if you have a notebook, uh, this is, I think it's like, I found this on IMAP Invasives, the photo on the left. Um, but it's like one of those, I think it's one of those takeout trays that you get uh, the person pop the plant in there and it just really pops against that background. Another thing the person could have done is put a little water in that dish to make the plant float. So if, if you don't aren't able to get a picture of the plant in the lake or the pond, you can take it out. And if you have a little dish or a Frisbee or something like that, you could put the plant in there with a little water. And then on the right, pretty self-explanatory. Um, that it looks like a grass is really popping against that white notebook. Um, and the other thing too, with both of these photos is a sense of scale. There's a, a quarter in that picture on the left. I know what a quarter is. Now I have a pretty good idea of how big that plant is. And then there's a hand in a notebook in the picture on the right. So again, you know, I, I know about how big a human hand is and about how big a notebook is. So I can get a pretty good idea of how big that, that plant is from that photo. And then we talked about camera settings a lot. Use the camera settings to blur the background. Um, take a look at these two pictures here. Notice how that black background is blurred and just how much that flower and those little hemlock branches on the left there pop against that background. It, it's super helpful to, to be able to do that and, and to be able to look at a picture that way if you're trying to ID something. All right, now I'm going to hand it over to Brian. Thank you all for your attention, and we'll do a Q&A after.
Well, Sean, maybe we can, um, you know, we've had a lively discussion in the chat. I've been kind of following and maybe it'd be good if we could spend a couple of minutes just kind of focusing on some of these camera related questions and things right now. And then oh, I'll okay. kind of go in, into my thing. So um, one question early on in the chat yeah. was you talked about like, uh, you know, you getting a, um, like a mid-level, mid-range, like camera body. Can you like kind of explain what that means or what people should be looking for? Yeah, absolutely. When you spend a lot of money on a camera, uh, basically what a lot, I should say a lot of what you're paying for is the camera's ability to handle different situations. That, that's really what it boils down to. So there's kind of, I'll, I'll talk about digital cameras because phone cameras, I, I admittedly don't know quite as much about phone cameras. I just kind of use whatever came with my phone. Uh, but I should say that a lot of what you're spending money on when you buy a cell phone is also the camera. As the cameras on cell phones get better and better and better, the price goes up and up and up. So with digital cameras, I'll kind of break it down into three quick categories. Uh, you have what's commonly called a point and shoot camera. And that is going to have a fixed lens on it. You cannot remove that lens from that camera. Uh, it's also going to be a lot smaller. A lot of times these cameras are, you know, about that big, a little bit bigger than a deck of cards. And um, th they're not going to be as high quality. They're not going to be able to work in as many uh, challenging lighting situations, but they're going to be quick for just pulling out of your pocket and taking a quick picture. And they're also probably going to be a lot cheaper. Um, Mid-range camera body is... Um, I, I hate to like endorse, you know, products, but like I have a Canon Rebel is what I have. And that, that's a decent, I'm not as familiar with Nikon, uh, my personal camera is Rebel, um, but that's kind of their mid-range series. And uh, basically it just means it's not quite as expensive as, as the top of the line series. So the price difference is going to be where you might be able to find a, a refurbished version for less than $1,000 for this camera body. If you get one of the top range camera bodies, you're gonna be spending like thousands of dollars, like four or $5,000 or more. A lot of these higher end, well, I should say, a lot of these cameras can do video pretty well, but a lot of higher end video, uh, uh, camera bodies are gonna do video way better than a mid-range. Um, and again, that, that boils down to just like, how well the uh, the light sensor is in the camera. So when you're adjusting your ISO, you're telling it how sensitive you want it to be to light. In my camera, I can get to maybe 1600 or 3200. And that's where I start to see the grain and the noise that I was talking about. If I spent $5,000 on my camera body and had a decent lens to go with it, I'd be able to shoot way higher, probably twice, twice that before I started to get grain. And then you're going to notice, like, when you go into the settings, I get lost. I've used a couple high-end cameras. I'm just like, I don't even know what half this stuff does because there are so many ways to tweak, like, every little aspect of the things that we talked about um, in these more expensive cameras. Um, so, yeah, that that's does that answer the question? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good review. Yeah, um, and, then, and then with the lenses, you know, it's the same kind of thing. You can spend a little money or a lot of money on a lens, and a lot of what you're paying for with a lens is the glass. And the glass is going to really determine how clear that image is, how well it captures the colors that you're looking at. Um, and, it's, and it's gonna relay that information to the camera body. So that's why I always stress with people, if you're on a budget, you know, getting that mid-range camera body and then you know, maybe spending a little more on a lens, I, I think is gonna benefit you more because have, skimping on the lens and getting a really expensive camera body you're you're going to limit what that camera body can do because it's not getting the information it needs from the lens from the the cheaper lens that you bought. Yeah, that's a that's a good review, Sean. Um, one of the other questions that we were chatting about in there was um on like cam uh, smartphones. You know, we have your a built-in camera. Many of the cameras that come with them have you know like built-in settings, so like portrait or like night mode or different things, and that you know, these settings are kind of like pre-changing the, the three legs of the stool, the, the ISO, the shutter speed, the f-stop. Um, and then that, you know, some of them kind of uh, have where you can go in and you can manually even change that on a, on a smartphone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is that, I'm sorry, is that a question or? Well, I'm just kind of reviewing. What oh, we were, okay. What we're yeah, no, that, that that's true. And that's actually a good way, a good assessment of some of those built-in settings like night mode. Um, again, you know, it probably depends on your camera and frankly, how much money you spent on or your phone, rather, how much money you spent on your phone. I think some of those 
uh, especially maybe 10 years ago. I think they affected the settings, but I think some of them almost acted like filters too. If you've ever seen filters where you can sort of change the sort of the the warmth of the colors in the image or things like that. So that I think some of them maybe back in the day um, weren't dealing with the settings as much, but or maybe we're dealing with the settings, but we're also adding a filter to kind of compensate for, you know, the cameras being subpar, cell phone cameras being subpar back in the day. But but I think that's exactly correct, though. I think especially on more modern cameras, um, phone cameras, I can think cameras, phone cameras, um, you're going to get, like, when you go into that night mode, you're probably going to be looking at a longer shutter speed. It's going to be open for longer. Uh, you're probably going to be looking at a higher ISO and maybe a lower f-stop. Uh, portrait mode is probably going to be a lower f-stop because it's going to focus more on on the person you're shooting and and blur the background for you. Um, but yeah, the manual settings really just go in there and find something you want to take a photo of. Set your ISO to it's it's, it's a nice thing. I'm going to put it at 200. Take a picture at 200 and then raise it up to 1600 and just see what it does. You'll see the difference. You'll see that it might be so bright that you can't even see what you were taking a picture of because it's letting so much light into that camera that there's no image left. And then the last question, Sean, if you could go back to um, the Moody Pond, we had a photo yeah. of one of the last ones. You had a, a, a photo of um, uh, the, the the pond lilies, yeah, right there, the, the pond lilies. Oh um, yeah, uh, that are on there. So somebody was asking a question, like, okay, well, what would you change if you wanted to get the cloud reflection in the water to be sharper? What are some of the settings you would oh. try to adjust? I would let more light into the camera. Yeah, I would try, and, and that that's kind of a hunch because so if you're out on top of a mountain and it's a nice blue sky day but with the big white puffy clouds uh, we've all seen them right the sky is this beautiful dark blue but you've got these white puffy clouds those clouds are bright you don't realize it like they don't hurt your eyes when you look at them but the camera to a camera reading light those clouds are way brighter than that dark sky so it's really interesting if you want to try to take a picture of that to get the clouds so they're not all blown out. You actually you have to actually have to shoot at a, a faster shutter speed to do that because those clouds are so it's challenging because those clouds are so bright. This is a different situation. Um, yeah, I would try adjusting the shutter speed. Um, I might I might lower it to let the brightness of the clouds come through. That might work. But if that didn't work, I would put it the other way. <laughs> and, and, and this is actually really a great question because it kind of goes back to what I keep saying about practice, practice, practice. I'm still learning. I've been doing this for well over 10 years now. And I don't know that I've ever tried to get the reflection to show up more. Now I kind of want to go out and try to do it. Uh, the best way is, is to experiment. Um, I was obviously shooting to get that, that pond lily nice and crisp. So that's where my settings are aimed at um but if i wanted to to make those clouds you you could do it yeah so sorry i didn't give you an exact answer i just gave you a couple things that i would try yeah and you know another good point about this is like in this kind of situation like this subject matter um you know the pond lilies and the plant they're just sitting there so you you can you have that opportunity to take multiple photos it's not like a a live person event or uh, a, you know an animal running across where you don't have you know many opportunities but this is this is one where you can you know play around with those settings and see what what works better that's exactly it and you know i i could if you want to hear just a little bit more about lenses um one thing i could add is uh it's it's, it's, it's a really big world in case you, you haven't gathered that there's so much to talk about um but if you're looking to shoot like sports or something like that where people are moving fast a more expensive lens is actually going to take photos faster too. There, there are lenses out there that could take dozens and dozens of photos in one second. So you're trying to capture that motion, then you go through them and pick the best one when you're when you're done and back when you're home. Um, so that's one thing you're paying for too when you buy a more expensive lens is you're getting a, one that can shoot faster. Um, also, I would recommend paying attention to the f-stop on, on your lens if you go out to buy one you want to try to find a lens that has a relatively low f-stop i think mine shoots down to 2.8 and that's pretty good like that's a pretty good all-purpose f-stop that can handle low light situations pretty well and the last thing i'll say so i don't want to confuse everyone but it, 
the lens I have can also zoom in a bit. It's not like a full zoom lens, which are huge and really heavy. I wanted something I could take hiking, but where I could still zoom in a bit and get that effect where I'm bringing the mountains closer and all that. So I picked this lens that kind of has a, a medium, I would say, zoom, a, zoom ability, um, but it also shoots down to uh, 2.8. Now, some lenses, the f-stop will actually go up as you zoom in. So when you look at the lens, it might have a range. If I say 2.8 to f.6 or 5.6, that means as you zoom in, that f-stop, the lowest it can shoot down to is 5.6. Um, the lens I have is what's called through the lens, which means it will shoot at 2.8 through the lens. So even if I zoom in, it can still shoot down to 2.8. And those lenses cost a little bit more, but they're totally worth it because you've got that flexibility with the lower F stop. Sean, this has been really fantastic. Thank you. I um, I just emailed you a photo that one of our landowners um, here in Hamilton County sent. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you could pop it up on the screen and use it as an example, um, just sort of, you know, from, from the people who are trying to help our standpoint, just, reviewing the importance of taking nice, clear images. And this person was concerned with snails. And this is, and Sean, I just, I emailed you the photo of what we got. <laughs> okay, um, hang on a second here. Let me, oh, I just came in. Oh, great. Okay, so let me, I have too many things open. Let me just <laughs> do this and I'll share my screen again so everyone can see it. And I thought it'd be really cool for, for you to sort of to describe the picture. You know, you have expertise with photography. You're a great photographer. And just explain to the people online, you know, from, from the aspect of people who are trying to help, you know, if this is the only photo we get, we, we're totally at a loss. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'll just be candid here. You know, this is nothing personal, but my, my first question, yes. when I look at this image is, is what is it an image of? You know what? Like, what am I looking at here? What What is the subject of the photo? It should be snails, which are in there someplace. Right, and, and that's kind of what I mean. Um, yeah, that, that, I guess that's kind of my point. Is like, where are the snails? Oh, there they are. Like, you have to really zoom in. Um, yeah, I think there's a number of things. So, if if the goal is uh, to take photos of these snails, right? That's that's the question, right? Of how to do that a little bit better. Um, zooming in on the snails would be really helpful, you know, because right now, you know, as it is like this, right? You can all see this, right? So I'll show yeah. you. Can all see, you can all see the photo. Yeah, as this stands now, this isn't really a photo of snails, is it? It's a photo of my eye goes to that patch where the snails are, but I can't tell that there's snails there. And then it kind of follows the water to wherever, you know, and then it kind of disappears. Um, so yeah, for something like this, you're definitely gonna wanna get closer. You know, I don't, if you're dealing with a dangerous animal, right? You don't wanna get closer to it, that's okay. Snails are probably okay to get close to. So I would definitely suggest the person get closer to these snails. Maybe take, you know, if there's a piece of white birch bark around or something like that, they could pretty easily kind of scoop up a snail onto that white birch bark and then take a photo like that. If they're trying to show just how many of them they are, I would sort of take it. And, you know, it's a little tricky because the snails are kind of the color of the mud, right? There's only so much you can do about that. But I would kind of shoot the picture more like that. If you're basically just trying to show like, hey, look how many photos or look how many snails there are. Um, something like this, it's like, oh, okay, I, I can see them in there and I, I can actually count them if I want to. Um, so I, I guess I would suggest doing a couple different things I would in a couple different photos. I would do an up close one uh, on a piece of paper, white birch bark, just something that's going to contrast that dark snail body or shell. And then, you know, maybe one that's zoomed in a little bit more like this so you can actually kind of see the individual snails in, in the mud there yeah does that does that answer your question caitlin thank you that's uh, that's really great information i thought it would be kind of helpful for for those online to to hear your take on that and you know absolutely to keep these things in consideration when you're photographing 
for IMAP or for your website, we learned some really great tips here. So sort of spread the, you know, spread the word and everyone should take this course. It's, it's great. Cool. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And, you know, one other thing I could add is if the person wanted to show the what if there's a water body like if you look up in the photo if there's a water body there um they could sit down on the ground and angle the camera up so that dark patch where the mud and the snails are is kind of in the foreground but then in the background you could see that it opens up into a lake or a pond or whatever that, that'd be one way to do that too hmm. all right let me um go back to our here. Okay, can everyone yeah, see John, my... If you bring back up the uh, presentation, I can kind of go over some of the. We're going to highlight a couple species. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, those are those are great points. It was really, uh, you know, we get a ton of photos at at APIP, and I'm sure, like you know, Caitlin at Hamilton County, um, you know, and it's like some of these photos you get, you're like, I don't even really know what I'm looking at or I'm supposed to be looking at. And sometimes we'll even be like crazy distracting things. Like somebody sent me a, a photo once. It's like, hey, look at this plant. But like in the bottom of it was like a, like a, like a dead snake or something. So all you're looking, keep looking at is like the dead snake. And it's like, I don't really even know what's going on here. Um, so let me see if I can request remote control from Sean. And right. then I'll kind of uh, go through this. And so we're going to um, just do a very brief, like, talk about uh, six invasive plant species to be the, on the lookout. And um, there's three terrestrial and three aquatic ones. Um, and so, um, you know, some of these are ubiquitous. Others are just starting to appear. And there's a couple that aren't in our region, but we want to have people keep a lookout for. And so uh, I'm going to go over some of the key IDs that uh, ID features that would be good to include in the photos. And you can go out and probably find some of these invasives <laughs> around you and you can practice taking a photo. And then if you really want, you can uh, upload them into the IMAP app. And, um, and so it'd be a great thing to do during ISOL or uh, Invasive Species Awareness Week, which we're all happier here and learning about that during this week. So, uh, first, species or groups of species we're going to talk about is knotweed. This is one of the most common uh, terrestrial invasive species in the Adirondacks. There's multiple closely related species, Japanese knotweed, giant knotweed, bohemian knotweed. Um, these are all fast growing uh, herbaceous perennial shrubs. Um, you frequently see them along the sides of roadsides or edges of disturbances, parking lots, um, edges of forest. They have very large leaves um, that are alternate, usually very leather, leathery, uh, broadly ovate or heart-shaped. Um, you know, some of them can be much, much, much bigger, like you know, two two hands in in size. Another key feature that you know, if you're taking a photo, where you can kind of do like this multiple photos to really show, is taking a photo of the leaves, but then also of the the stems, they have these bamboo-like stems that are jointed and um, you know hollow. So if you break it off, it, it, it there's a hollow center to it. Um, and you know, in the winter time when this plant nests, um, you often see the the reddish brown stems are still visible. And then you know, usually like in late July and in August. Here you'll see these bright inflorescence of flowers, lots of bees and pollinators on them. Um, and so it is a uh, good example of, uh, you know, a really clear photo. So these inflorescences are, are helpful for the ID. And as you can see, this is a distribution. So when you upload things, IMAP invasives, it goes into our statewide database, and then people are able to just to see uh, online and other researchers and scientists and practitioners are able to, to get alerts and go through it. So very widespread in the Adirondacks, you would be able to find this somewhere around you and practice taking a photo of it. Uh, another species that is pretty widespread in New York, but just starting to come into the Adirondack region is uh, Japanese silkgrass or Microsthesium. Luminium, it is an annual grass that can grow very dense and sprawls along the ground as it grows. It can grow in the interior of forests, low light conditions, 
and completely cover over our native plants. Um, it has a very distinctive uh, leaf with this kind of silverish midrib that's uh, off center. So getting like an up close photo uh, of that would be a really good uh, key ID feature. And then uh, in late summer, it creates these little flower stalks. Um, it also has its roots that are kind of on stalks. So that's another good feature to kind, kind of show for it. This species is just starting to creep into the Adirondacks. We're very concerned about it because throughout New York, it's caused uh, a lot of big problems. And so uh, my terrestrial counterpart, um, Becca Bernanke, she's actively working on controlling and, and removing these populations. So if you see this, we would want you to, to, to take a photo and you know, send it to us or submit it to IMAP. And that way, uh, you know, we'll be able to go out and do something about it in, in a quick manner, which is, means we're much more likely to be able to control it to be successful and at a much lower cost. And then the last one is a uh, Japanese snowball. This is a member of the Viburnum uh, genus. It is a dense, multicolored, uh, deciduous shrub that can grow up to 10 feet tall. It has these snowball-like flower inflorescence. So um, it makes it popular for uh, in the landscaping industries. You know, people go and buy these from nurseries, not intentionally knowing that they're invasive, but then they can get out and uh, escape and cause problems in our natural areas. Uh, they have these two to four inch opposite uh, leaves that uh, so sometimes have this green in color, but then they turn this dark purple. In, in the fall, you'll see the edges of the leaves are, are toothed. So, you know, showing that leaf, getting that, that, that tooth, a fine up close picture of it is, is, is useful in the ID. And then you can see these flowers are inflorescence or they're many individual flowers that are coming out and, um, you know, that's another one of these key features to be able to, to take for proper identification. Uh, and then after they have flowers in, in late August, September, you'll see a small fleshy red fruit that will stay on them. Um, those are the things that, you know, the birds like to eat and then they're, that helps spread them or unfortunately spread them around to our natural areas. So uh, another key feature. Um, as you can see, we don't have any inside the blue line yet. There's a few right outside nearby. Um, and so if you did see something like this, you know, taking a photo, a good photo and sending it to us would be useful. Okay, now we're gonna switch to our aquatic ones. Uh, generally a little bit harder to take a photo, but if you do some of those tips like floating in water and, um, you know, focusing in, changing maybe some of your, your apertures or your, your shutter speed to let more light in, you can get a good photo for it. Um, Eurasian water milfoils are most widely uh, spread aquatic invasive species in the United States and in the Adirondacks. It is a Myriophyllum. Um, we do have some native Myriophyllums here, some native milfoils, but um, by showing these key characteristics, we can, we can tell the difference between them. Um, these can be, these are submerged perennial plant that grows up to the surface of the water, can grow up to almost 20 feet deep. Um, the leaves are feather-like, so you're seeing the leaves here. Uh, there's a central rachis and then individual leaflets that come off from it, and they're feather-like. That's the key feature for milfoil genus. Um, these Eurasian ones can have these kind of clipped appearance, with these mini individual leaflets and that when you take it out of water it kind of all goes limp on itself so when it's out of water it's much harder to kind of really see these key features um, the stems is another key feature it has this cream colored to pinkish reddish colored stems and there's these large internodal spaces the space between the whorls in eurasian water is is large Whereas with the other native species, it's very co much closer. And then they have some of these, um, you know, photos, uh, I mean, excuse me, photos of the, the inflorescence flowers, which are above water for, for this one. Uh, here you can see our most widespread in, invasive 
uh, aquatic invasive species in the Adirondacks. Uh, another one is European frogbit. It is a free floating annual plant. Uh, it's like kind of a small pond lily. Uh, it has these rounded leathery kind of leaves with this kind of chordate or heart shape. Um, and also has some kind of clear venation. So here's a great photo where I can clearly see that shape. You can see the flower up clear. So this one makes it really easy for, for a professional to identify. Um, it has three petals on the flowers. Uh, there's a native species that's kind of similar, but it has five white petals. So having three white petals is a key feature. And then another key feature of this is that the roots and the, 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 the stems kind of all grow together in a tangle. So when you kind of pull it up out of this water, like this hand, they're all like massed together. So that's another key feature that you frequently see. So the roots don't go all the way down. It's not really rooted in the substrate. It's kind of free floating in the water. Um, here's the distribution. It's pretty common in Lake Champlain and the St. Lawrence River Valley. Not too much in the interior of the Adirondacks and we're really trying uh, to, to control populations in the interior and to remove it out. So that's European frogbit. And then last is hydrilla. Um, it's in the hydrilla verticillatica. It is the uh, super weed that we do not want in the Adirondacks. Uh, we are actively trying to eradicate this from the state of New York. It causes lots and lots of problems in different areas. Um, so we are uh, uh, really working on removing this, this plant. You see it in those dense beds, it can grow underwater. The key feature is that it has these whirls of leaves in um, uh, four to eight. And then the edge of the leaf you can see in these photos is, is kind of serrated. Uh, it has these little teeth on it and will have a spine on it. This is the key feature because there's a native species that is called um, uh, Elodea, Elodea canadensis or Elodea natalii, that looks pretty similar, has whorls in three generally, but it has a smooth leaf margin or leaf edge. So getting these kind of spines and these whorls is really important. Um, it can spread by turians or flowers, um, although we don't rarely, don't always see these features. Um, there's none in the Adirondacks and we're trying to keep it that way. Uh, it is in the Finger Lakes, uh, down in Long Island, on the lower Hudson region, uh, the Niagara River out there. So uh, this is one that we really want you to kind of keep your eye out for. And if we saw it, we need to find it early so we can treat it and take care of it. All right, um, so now we're gonna go into the IMAP Invasives mobile app. Uh, this is a really good way where you can take a photo with your camera, either like your smartphone camera in the camera settings, you know, adjust the cameras, and then you can upload it through this app when you're at the location. So it records the GPS location and all that other information. With it, there is an Apple and Android. I put these links in the uh, in the in the chat earlier, so you can you could download this and do it right on. And so now, what I'm going to try to do is. Um, I'm going to kind of switch over to my phone and um, uh, try to run this so you can see a live demo on my phone. So, Sean, if you can stop sharing now and then. Recording in progress. There we go. I think you're all set. Sean, can you hear me now? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, so let me see if I can go share my screen. Okay. And then let me see, bring up the IMAP. Um, Sean, can you give me, can you tell me if you can see this? Yep, you're good. Okay, good. Um, so you will see, um, this is what it pops up and looks like. So we'll go through just like we're gonna add an observation. So. Um, once you signed in and created your account, in the top right is this add observation. 
<laughs> so it'll uh, push that button and it'll come through. And then you have the option of either selecting a photo that you've already taken or um, using uh, the camera. So I'm going to say take uh, the photo using the camera. And so it'll bring it up. And then, you know, now you're just taking it with your thing. So you can see here's my here's my computer right now. So I'm just going to I'll take a picture of my computer. Um, one thing to note is that in the settings of this app, you can um, you can select the photo quality. Um, so you know, it can downsize your photos or it can take at 100%. So make sure to adjust them. Um, the next thing is after I've taken the photo and you know shown the key characteristics, you can then uh, go through and click on the species list. And so then you can find what species it is that uh, you're trying to report. I'm just gonna do this uh, fake species for testing right now, just to kind of go through them. Um, and then most of the time you're doing this, uh, a species detected uh, photo right there. And then your observation date will automatically uh, go through and populate. Um, it will show, uh, it'll drop a pin where you are with your, with your latitude and longitude automatically. So that, that captures it. Um, <clears throat> um, if you have an Android right now, they're having an issue showing the, the local base map, but, um, on, on a, uh, on an Apple, it will work. <laughs> um, if you're part of a project, like you can be part of some projects, like our APIP volunteer lake program project so you could like uh, kind of select the project to associate it with if you're part of an organization like uh, a club or group you can do that you can say how long you searched for it um you know so you could type in like 10 minutes or something excuse <coughs> me and then um really like showing about like the size of the area so is this is it giving some some information about it like okay is it up to 10 square feet up to half an acre, up to an acre or more than an acre. So how large is the infestation? So I'll just click on, um, let's say, say it's up to an acre. And then the distribution of it. So is it trace, like a single plant? Is it sparse, like a couple uh, clump plants? Or is it dense plants? Or is it like a solid monoculture? So for an example, I'll just say this was some dense plants all throughout this one acre area. And then you have like your observation where you can write in any comments like, um, you know, the, where you were, you know, or, uh, you know, maybe the light conditions or all, anything else. So I'll just write down uh, photo class, you know, it's just to have a thing in here. And then you hit save. <coughs> and you go back to the main page and you'll see now saved it on your phone. So the good thing about this is this can work anywhere without a cell phone service. Um, so you can be in, in the remote woods and, and do this anywhere. And then when you come back, you can uh, take these examples and you'll see I'll click on them. And here's a previous one I did for Bandit Mystery Snail the other day. So I'll click on them. And then in that top left, that menu option, um, click on that and click Upload Selected. And I'll click Okay, do I want to upload these two records? And now what it does is once you're back at home and have Wi-Fi or have a data connection, it will upload those things to the cloud server. And then uh, people like myself and other ones will get alerts about it and it'll be part of there. And then uh, experts will get to review those and either approve them or correct ID. And then they'll stay online that allow everybody to be able to see it. So um, that is the IMAP mobile app. Do we have any questions about that? I'm not seeing any in the chat. Uh, if, if someone has a question, feel free to just go off mute and ask. Well, as you can see, it's a, you know, really easy thing to do. Um, and, you know, you should be able to, uh, you know, you can play around with it. You can do some of those different things. You can do the fake species if you, if you want to test it out. But, um, yeah, it should be 
uh, a good thing for everybody to do. So, so thanks for listening to that. And yes, yeah, and you can go through the, the last little bit to wrap up. All right. Thanks, Brian. And, you know, thanks everyone again for coming to this. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. I, I love talking about photography. So feel free to email me or ask some questions here in a second if you have any more questions at all. Uh, I just wanted to quickly go through the rest of our summer webinar series. Uh, June 21st, we have a Lake Protectors virtual training. Uh, Brian will be there, I, I am told. <laughs> um, and that's from 9 to 11.30 a.m. These are all free. Uh, uh, July 20th, we have best management practices for roadside invasives. And then on August 2nd, we are going to launch the second part of our forest pest hunters uh, surveying for beech leaf disease. So lake protectors and forest pest hunters are the kind of a terrestrial and aquatic versions of each other uh, where we, we train folks how to identify invasive species. We go through IMAP invasives with them and then we uh, they, they agree to adopt a trail or a lake and then they go out and survey it uh, at least once during the, the summer period. And to learn more or to register, you can go to adkinvasives.com slash events. And all of these recordings, including this one today, is going to be available. Um, you can get to it through our uh, adkinvasives.com or you can just go to APIP's YouTube channel and you'll find them all there. And then last but not least, I wanted to mention that we do have free, totally free outreach materials. Um, these are very helpful. Some of them are, are nice little guides to have. Some of them are good if you, you know, if, if you have a place where people are coming through, like a restaurant or something like that, and you want to hang up a poster, uh, just reach out. You can order them at adkinvasives.com slash order, or you can contact me directly and I will get them out to you. Uh, the top three are brochures. Well, the one on the right is a rack card, so it's just a double-sided card, and then protect your forests and protect your waters. Uh, goes over some good preventative measures that everyone should be taking as, as they go out and recreate in the Adirondacks or anywhere, really. And you're, you're going to find a few species in each one of those, too. And then the posters are, are basically what you see there. Um, they mostly focus on uh, prevention, clean, drain, dry, and uh, you know, using boot brush stations and cleaning your gear and things like that. And then on the right here, we have the field guide to terrestrial invasive species of the Adirondacks. Uh, this covers, this is a little field guide that we put together last fall. It covers 28 invasive species. Uh, the first part of it goes over plant identification. So it's kind of what Brian and I talked about earlier, but a little bit more in depth. So if you're looking to learn more about how to ID plants, it's a really good place to start. Uh, then we have the 28 species. And then in the back of the guide, we have information on IMAP invasives. And this is totally free as well. There is a limit uh, to 10 on these is because it's a, it's a bigger publication, uh, but you can order them through adkinvasives.com slash order or reach out to me directly. And there's my email, there's Brian's email. And does anyone else have any questions? See, this is a good example of a photo you can use as a background. See, it's a nice scenic photo. And I'm gonna check the chat and see if there's any questions here. Sounds like people really enjoyed it. Thank you, thank you. I know we covered a lot of information. So if you have any questions and you want to follow up with me, feel free to do that. There, there's a lot of information crammed into this. And if nobody has any questions, we'll say goodbye. All right, thank you all for coming. This will be on our YouTube channel, if not this afternoon, Monday morning. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day. Have a good weekend. Sean and Brian, thank you. Awesome as usual. Happy I saw everyone. Thanks, Caitlin. Thanks for coming. And thanks for that great question with the photo. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. I thought it was kind of a good real world <laughs> example of what we all do. Um, yeah, so thank you. <laughs>